Hi there, good afternoon everyone. I'm Dawn Jeffries and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. I just wanted to apologize for starting late. We were having a, a little technology uh, challenge this afternoon. So I apologize, but uh, our panelists are here and we are going to have um, a very good discussion today. As always, we are recording this session. It will be available um, after we wrap up today, provided we don't have any more glitches <laughs> with, our, with our Zoom and YouTube technology. At any rate, we have invited a panel of medical experts to talk with us today about what they're seeing in our community, both here in Blacksburg, as well as our broader community. So I'd like to introduce first Dr. Noel Bissell, director of the New River Health District. You know, I'd also like to point out that Dr. Bissell has been a partner with Virginia Tech throughout the pandemic and has really shared her insight and expertise as the university has managed COVID over the last 19 months or so. Joining us from Roanoke, Dr. Lee Learman and Dr. Paul Skolnick. Dr. Learman is Dean of the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, and Dr. Skolnick is the Chair and Professor of Medicine at the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, as well as Carilion Clinic. So welcome to all three of you. I know you are all very busy, and we really appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions today and your patience as we started this afternoon. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that I'll be asking are really some of the same questions that our community is asking. So I'll get right to that. Um, if I can start off just asking each of you, can you tell us what you're seeing in our community? Each of you have different perspectives based on your, uh, on your specific roles in our community, but what are you seeing? Where do things stand as it relates to COVID? Dr. Bissell, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so we are seeing our case numbers come down now. We have had the Delta surge as most of the, the country has. Um, we peaked in early September. Case numbers now are coming down as expected after the variant. Um, uh, you know, with our vaccination rates where they are, we did not see a, a logarithmic rise, but we aren't vaccinated enough that we didn't see any surge. Um, and our decline is, is certainly not dropping like a rock, but it is dropping steadily. We continue to see that most of our cases are in individuals who are not yet vaccinated. Uh, a lot of those are our children who cannot yet be vaccinated. And we're looking forward to uh, the coming weeks where the vaccine should be authorized for use in our five to 11 year olds. And we're planning for that. Um, so we still have a, a robust caseload, but it, it's heading in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Dean Learman? Uh, well, we're seeing, um, well, I should preface this by saying that there are uh, regional differences and even micro-regional differences in how the pandemic has been playing out. Um, so what we're seeing in our local community within the medical school and our health system are breakthrough cases. We're seeing uh, so-called breakthrough cases, folks that had had a complete series of vaccinations uh, who have then gone on to become infected with COVID, uh, some asymptomatic, some minimally symptomatic, and unfortunately some who have been quite ill and hospitalized as well. So we're seeing uh, this and, and we haven't, uh, our perception is we really haven't turned the corner in the way that you're describing in Montgomery County and for uh, Blacksburg's main campus that we are continuing to uh, have to, um, you know, take, um, take prevention of spread very seriously in light of the fact that we have a high percent of unvaccinated folks and even those who are vaccinated can then have breakthrough infections and transmit to unvaccinated people who are going to have a worse outcome. So we're, we're at a, a different level of, of vigilance at this point, uh, having not uh, turned the corner in quite the same way that uh, has occurred in Blacksburg. Is there a, is there a difference in what you're um, seeing in terms of the outcomes with the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated in terms of those breakthrough cases? Indeed, that's a good transition to Dr. Skolnick for sure. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Skolnick. Yeah, yeah I'll, I, I'll comment on that, Don, and, and extend what, what Dean Lehrman just said. Um, so Carilion Clinic spans six health districts and we're present both in the uh, southwestern and far southwestern part of Virginia. This regional theme is, is certainly relevant. For hospitalized patients, we have not seen a, a decline. We have more hospitalized patients now than we've ever had. 
and that is leading to a higher death rate than we've ever had. We have three or four patients dying every day. Patients are transferred to Roanoke from other places like Carilion, New River Valley, et cetera. This is reflective of the fact that there still is a high level of transmission throughout Southwestern Virginia. Um, the surge with Delta virus this time around in terms of absolute numbers is slightly lower than the surge that occurred in January and February of this year. But Delta variant is much more transmissible and it causes much more <laughs> severe disease. So for those who are hospitalized and even for those who are not, there are more deaths. Those uh, affected are younger than they were before. And the severity of illness is captured by the fact that fully a third of all the patients admitted now are, are in ICUs. That's very different than previously. 20% of all our admitted patients are fully vaccinated. And so while there's absolutely huge benefit to being vaccinated, nonetheless, vaccination is not perfect. It wasn't at the beginning of the pandemic and it isn't now, but it's less perfect than it was before. And so we've had patients die from two years old to 101 years old. And, and everything in between. I will say that vaccination does help protect the, in the sense that those who are dying who are fully vaccinated tend to be older. Those who are dying who are unvaccinated tend to be younger, but transmission uh, is ongoing. Schools are opening. There are all sorts of reasons why this continues. So I would concur, we're, we're not out of the woods yet. So that, that begs the question of what we do next, given those scenarios. Um, and I, I wanna start with something that's, that's really timely, especially, and that's booster shots. Uh, what's the status of those and um, who should get them? I don't know who wants to take that first, feel free to. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I can just lay the groundwork. Um, so the process is that First, the data are viewed by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and they opine. And then it goes to the CDC, the ACIP panel, which further considers and makes recommendations as to uh, who should receive either additional doses if you're immunocompromised or booster doses if you're not. Those criteria vary with the different vaccine preparations a, a bit. Uh, Pfizer has been approved for booster vaccinations if you're more than six months out from your last or second dose of the vaccine. And there have been certain groups that have been identified uh, who qualify, uh, older individuals, people who are younger with certain medical conditions, people who work in certain frontline occupations who have more chance of being exposed. Moderna, um, and Johnson and Johnson were just before the FDA, and the, those will be approved. Moderna, probably very similar to Pfizer, but the criteria for Johnson and Johnson are different. And that is two months or more after your single shot. And whether that's with another dose of Johnson and Johnson or mixed, as we say, with one of the mRNA is still a bit under discussion. I will say that we are very supportive of booster vaccinations, both because immunity wanes over time and vaccination increases the breadth of immune response so that you're protected against more of the variants. You know, as I listen to Dr. Skolnick's kind of up-to-date summary, I'm intrigued by how difficult it may be to communicate some messaging uh, around this to individuals that have had one or another of the vaccines initially. It's not as simple as to say, a booster is a good thing, get it if you can, although that's probably what I would say. Uh, Dr. Bissell, what are your thoughts on, on this topic about how to communicate where we're at with boosters? It has been very challenging, the, the booster discussion, because of the way it was rolled out and the messaging has been very confusing. 
Um, I will say that um, we did not have that overwhelming demand for boosters that we expected or anticipated would come. Um, we, we did try very hard to say that um, the, the, your immunity doesn't just drop off to zero at six months and one day, that you know, certainly those who are higher risk should be prioritized uh, over those who are otherwise healthy and, and less risk with, with COVID. Um, so we've rolled it out. We are working very closely with our, our public information folks. We use social media. We do regular press briefings to try and explain where we are with booster doses. We get a lot of phone calls. Um, I would say the biggest questions we get are about the mixing and matching. Uh, for instance, people who got Johnson & Johnson wanting an mRNA or people who got Pfizer wanting Moderna or, or vice versa. Um, and the FDA is looking at that data right now. Uh, there's also a lot of confusing uh, confusion about third doses versus booster doses. So we do try to use the CDC criteria and explain that this is what we mean by immunocompromised. Uh, those folks are expected to not mount a normal immune response. So it's not unusual to use additional doses, whereas people with a healthy, competent immune system are expected to mount a, a normal immune response that may wane. So that's when we talk about doing booster doses. Um, so we have been doing the, the third doses for both Moderna and Pfizer, and that's been going very well. Um, we are doing the booster doses for Pfizer. And as I said, it, we're able to handle that with our pharmacy partners and with our health department clinics. And we are waiting, we expect later this week that the Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson will be authorized and, and we'll start offering that. And then we wait to hear about the mixing of vaccines as well. But it, it's challenging because it has been very confusing messaging. I think the public, as we're living this real time, the public thinks that we keep changing things and, and we really are just adapting as we learn more and we, we collect new data. And, and it's not that we're going back on things or changing things, we're just adapting and that's essential during a pandemic. Hey, Don, would it be okay to insert a follow-up question here? Because on this issue, I think it makes the most sense to put it here. And that is the question I've been receiving from folks in our community around the value of antibody testing, uh, as has been used in other countries to gauge one's individual immune response, although that's not the complete response, it's a measurable part of it, to decide whether someone needs a booster or not. Um, so, uh, you know, what what's a What's your answer to that question for a non-immunocompromised person, the value of antibody testing? Whoever wants to start. I, I can take that one, I think. First, let me make one follow-up point to the prior discussion. It, 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 it's very important to not just think about those who have been vaccinated. Our main message has been and always will be, if you haven't been vaccinated, please get vaccinated. That's what will help us get out of this pandemic and and move forward properly. And um, there, there's lots we could say about that. And the discussion also uh, trails into other, other areas as well. But um, Dean Lehrman, I think um, it, it's, it's really important for people to understand that these, these vaccines vary and we know that and we understand that. So for instance, Although it's complicated, our advice for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is different than from the mRNA vaccines. It appears as though the FDA is going to approve a second shot for Johnson & Johnson for, for everyone. And that's because the Johnson & Johnson was a single shot and is not as effective as the mRNAs uh, to move forward. Um, that, that, that's a critical issue, I would say. Noel, would you like to answer and expand on Dean Lehrman's question? Yeah, absolutely. I second, you know, first and second dose vaccinations are our priority and we continue to do those. Um, we, we have not been recommending testing antibody levels. We do know that a lot of people get them tested. Um, we know that they can be up at several thousand, but within 60 to 90 days of the vaccinations, we see them drop markedly, but we also know there are other components to the immune response. So to solely rely on a, a, a number, a level, I don't think gives us the full picture of immunity. Um, 
you know, there's certainly a memory response, there's certainly a T cell response, a cytotoxic response. Um, and we know from, from prior outbreaks, from prior pandemics, um, that, that those are pretty durable. We just, we have to follow and, and see. Um, we, we're learning as we go along here. Um, so while I do think having a, a robust antibody number um, is, is reassuring, even in the data from, from Israel and other places, those um, who had lower numbers per se, they still uh, had similar responses after vaccination, after booster, um, after getting COVID. So, so we do know that the, the absolute number is not the only thing to consider when we're weighing one's immunity. Um, and I do think we, we set unrealistic expectations that these vaccines were 100% effective. And we know that nothing's 100% effective. And we need to look at what our goals are um, as we're trying to get through the pandemic. I think let this me is take really that a, let me take that a step. Because... Can I take that a step further, uh, Don, if I might? The commercial assays that are available for measuring antibody do not measure the key ingredient, and that's neutralization. So when people see reports about antibody levels, those might be against the spike protein, they may be against the capsid antigen, but the commercially available antibody tests are not standardized. You can't compare one to the other and don't measure what we as infectious disease persons correlate with immunity. So we not only don't recommend antibody testing, we think that the commercial assays that are available now despite the direct-to-consumer advertising, are not useful to determine if you're immune or not immune. So they're really unhelpful. That's why you need to follow the other guidelines that are available in terms of vaccination and boosters. And I'll say it this way, don't wa waste your money on getting an antibody test. You really can't judge if you're immune or not. For all the reasons that a number doesn't mean anything in correlation to risk, and it doesn't measure the other aspects of immunity that we do measure in the laboratory. I think that this speaks a lot to um, folks who ask whether they should get the vaccination or people who may be reluctant to get so or, or not get one because you know maybe they've had COVID and they think they don't need it. What is the best recommendation for if you've had COVID, whether you should get the vaccination or not. I've no, I know we've talked about this before, but as things have evolved and we have more data, where does that stand now? Yeah, I, we alluded, I alluded to this before. And the CDC guidances are pretty well thought out. Um, so you, the recommendation is that even if you've had natural infection, that you get vaccinated. And the reason for that is that we know well from detailed studies now that that subsequent vaccination both increases the durability, the extent and time for which you'll have protective immunity, and also the breadth in terms of the variants that you might be able to protect yourself against. Um, some of the strongest immunity that we've seen so far involves that sort of vaccination pattern. Moreover, we do see reinfections, especially after 90 days after the first bout of infection. And it's, it's likely if you've been infected earlier during the pandemic that you're not gonna have uh, reasonable immunity to Delta, for instance, which is 99.9% .9 of what we see now. So there's a lot out there um, about this but the, the studies really show that your best protection, and you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting those in your household, those in the communities, other immunocompromised people who might exist is to go ahead and get the vaccination series. And just uh, logistically speaking about getting um vaccinations and boosters, and Dr. Bissell, I know you mentioned earlier that um, you haven't seen the demand that I, I don't recall if you said that was expected or just frankly haven't seen a demand in the boosters, but will we see any of the um, clinics, the large clinics like we saw before, or is the, the approach now to go to your pharmacy or to your general practitioner or the health department? 
when we did our large clinics, we were essentially the only ones providing vaccine. We didn't have all of our community partners, our pharmacies. We didn't have the federal pharmacy partners on board doing it. So most of the vaccinations, when the vaccine first came out, were provided through the health department and, and Carillion facilitated a huge vaccination clinic effort at the Berglund Center in Roanoke. And we did a lot at the Dedman Center um, and other locations here in the New River. Um, we have a lot more partners now who are vaccinating. Um, all of our federal pharmacy partners, Kroger, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, we have local pharmacy partners who've done a fabulous job. And we also have practices, individual practices that are vaccinating too. Um, so while we are ready to open large sites if we need to, we have scaled up what we're offering through the health department. And with our pharmacy partners, we have more than enough capacity for what the demand is right now. We're monitoring that closely. Um, all summer long, we were out doing outreach, trying to get those initial vaccines, the, those initial series in, in people, answering questions, doing that one-on-one -on -one engagement, which is so important that you can't do in a large site. Um, and, and now we are getting back to um, really trying to make sure we have capacity for large demand. And we do expect that's going to increase with the five to 11 year old authorization. We do expect as Johnson & Johnson and Moderna booster shots get an authorization that we will see increased demand. So we are very flexible. I will say, um, you know, again, in the New River Health District, we can scale up pretty quickly and, and we have a, a good pharmacy partnership. And there is a large site in Roanoke right now. It's um, at the Valley View Mall in the old Sears location. It operates six days a week from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m and they're doing all of the vaccines. So they're doing first doses, second doses, third doses, they're doing boosters. Um, once five to 11 year old authorization comes through, they'll be doing that as well. And I know a lot of New River residents um, can get to Roanoke fairly easily as well. So I do feel like we'll, we'll be okay with the way we're doing it right now, um, but we are ready if we need to, and we've gotten permission and been working with our larger venues, of course, we used Lane Stadium, we used um, the Deadman Center, we used some churches, and they're not as readily available right now. So it would take a little bit more logistical planning to make that happen. Hey, Dawn, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, the government is here to help us, uh, in which I, I, it's my tongue-in-cheek way of saying that we've come a long way since uh, the beginnings of the pandemic. And now, uh, if you just put vaccines.gov into your search bar, uh, you'll get to the CDC's website in which you can search by zip code or address for both COVID vaccines or if you wish, flu vaccines. Uh, they'll even connect you from that website into a, directly into an available pharmacy scheduling system so that you can actually make an appointment rather than waiting in, in an open line to, to receive your vaccine. So if anyone is, is uh, you know, wondering whether a vaccine opportunity like that might be closer to them than one of these other um, organized activities, then vaccines.gov is actually a pretty quick and, and easy way to find out what's, what's nearest to you and perhaps even very convenient in terms of making an appointment. Thank you both. Um, do you know, I wanted to ask, last month, President Sands shared a message with our community and, and really offered appreciation for the sacrifices our community members made, which allowed uh, Virginia Tech to have this, this full scale or normal, more normal uh, opening everything from vaccinations that led to that, to testing, to masking in indoor spaces. Can you talk about how important having a, a multi-layer approach like that is to mitigating risk, but also answer the question to why, you know, a lot of folks think we're a high, highly vaccinated community in, in terms of campus uh, with the mandates, but a lot of people are saying, why are we still wearing masks? Why can't we forego the masks? Um, what do we say to those folks? So I think at the start, I think we all, all three of us probably have a comment on that um, thought provoking question because here we are at a specific place in time in which there has been enormous success uh, in turning uh, the pandemic around in, in the uh, Montgomery County and in Blacksburg and in Virginia Tech. And that uh, everyone deserves an enormous amount of credit for really just setting a wonderful example of how uh, to implement um, a variety of initiatives to um, push vaccination rates so far 
uh, that it, it approaches, if, doesn't, if it doesn't define it, it approaches herd immunity, which then changes the whole nature of, of transmission in a particular community. And that's a wonderful outcome, but it is, a, it is right now in, a, in this sort of place in time and it's fragile. It's fragile because of what's happening in other parts of, of uh, Virginia and around the country. And therefore our vigilance is still needed um, because we, we know where we've been, which is, and, and we know the, the curves that we see uh, in terms of infection rates coming down, hospitalizations coming down, but we don't know where we're going. We really don't know what to anticipate in the future around the risk that presents itself to the community. And so um, the most conservative uh, approach would be to continue just to stay the course and continue to um, rally around all of the positive outcomes that people have achieved so far. Um, that would be uh, one approach uh, to, to kind of keeping things as safe as they can be. Uh, although um, folks would naturally be considering um, changes to safety protocols that seem to make sense based on the data. So that's where the, dis the, the discussion we would be, if changes are made, what would trigger a return to the former policies in this very fluid state of being wanting to be responsive to data, but realizing that um, the future is unpredictable. So those are the challenges that I see, but enormous credit goes to all of the efforts that have uh, been made to achieve where Virginia Tech is right now. Dr. Bissell, were you going to say something earlier? Well, I was going to say, we still are seeing high community transmission. Um, we were way up there and we are seeing encouraging numbers coming down, but we still do have um, high community transmission. Um, and nothing is 100%. And that's why they talk about it being layered mitigation strategies. Obviously, we endorse vaccination and our students at, at both Tech and, and Radford did a phenomenal job of, of getting vaccinated. Um, our faculty and staff at the, at the institutions did as well. Um, our community numbers are, are less. Our, our community vaccination rates are, are less than, than what we see on campus. And there, there is some interaction back and forth. Um, I agree that I think we are seeing success regionally because we do have those rates with some of our higher risk population. We know last year, the, the bulk of our cases in the New River Health District were our college students. They're very social beings and, and they, they had fun and, and they were responsible for the bulk of our cases. And this year they're responsible for a very, very small number of our cases because of the vaccination. Um, so I, I agree, I think we need to stay the course. Um, I, I do think, and, and um, in public health, people have varying opinions as well. I, I do think that we, we can't discount immunity from infection. Um, I, I will make it very clear that we always advocate when we have a safe, effective vaccine, we always advocate vaccination over, um, I'm a product of the chickenpox parties generation. And, and we just, we don't do that now if we have a safe, effective vaccine because we know that, that any side effects from the vaccine are going to present within the first eight weeks after vaccination. But uh, as my colleagues can say, side effects from the disease, the long COVID and whatnot can present weeks, months, and probably even more than a year later and, and can be very debilitating. So we would always advocate vaccination, um, but certainly acknowledge that uh, after having infection, there is immunity there. Um, you know, our hope is that um, we will continue to see the declining cases and that future waves, because I don't think any of us expect that COVID is going to go away. We aren't going to eradicate it. Uh, future waves would be smaller as we develop those thresholds for immunity. And hopefully we, we continue to practice some of those behaviors that we know work. Um, stay home when you're sick. Um, don't go to work, don't go to school and infect other people. Respiratory hygiene, hand hygiene. Um, outside is much safer than inside. Those kinds of things will serve us well, not just with COVID, but with any respiratory transmitted infections. Yeah, I mean, I, in addition to those points, um, it, it may be helpful for, for students and other members of Virginia Tech to think about the fact that in, in younger people who do get infected and the vaccine is not perfect, we also have people who have exemptions of various types. Often those people are asymptomatic. And so you don't know that they're infected. And that's a very risky situation as transmission is high in the community. We're not an island unto ourselves. There are interactions. So there are people on campus who 
will be infected and will be capable of transmitting to others, even if they're asymptomatic. Again, kudos to that extremely high vaccination rate. That's really wonderful and important. But as Dean Lehrman said, uh, prudence is still key here and we're not out of the woods. So as we reassess things, as we see new situations arise, as we understand that not everyone on the Virginia Tech campus is a student and everyone goes home and has families who are in schools and kids who have not been vaccinated, it's just not the time to, um, to, to move away from our very simple but important mitigation strategies of masking, good hand hygiene, distancing when appropriate. You know, I wanted to ask a little bit earlier, a month or so ago, there was a lot of concern about uh, returning to football and, and those large ga gatherings that came along with that. You know, the university has said that it, it, you know, Virginia Tech uses a lot of different factors in making decisions, science being a, a big element of that. Um, and the science showed that there was low to no outdoor transmission. Um, now that we've had a few months, um, a few weeks rather, after the start of the football season, what has the data shown about what, frankly, a lot of people feared would be super spreader events? And I want to talk about that as we think about moving forward into yeah. fall so, a little deeper as well. Maybe I can just make some initial comments. I think what the data, at least at Virginia Tech, has shown is that there's been no transmission amongst those being tested on campus, the students. We, we really don't know about all those other people who are in the stadium who are not being tested may come from other venues, may have been vaccinated or not vaccinated. So it has been a success as far as I can tell amongst the student body who was vaccinated. The great outdoors is a wonderful uh, help to preventing transmission. Um, and so that's a factor that certainly enters into this. I think um, ventilation indoors and airflow indoors will also be important. So as some indoor sports start to be pursued, that may be a different calculus in terms of risk of transmission, even amongst uh, a student body who's vaccinated. Again, with basketball, for instance, they will be people in that arena unless the decision is made to check vaccination status. There will be people in that arena who are not vaccinated or who have other risk factors. So. Um, again, kudos to that success story, and let's be careful and prudent and understand uh, what the risks are and what we need to do to mitigate those risks. Well, what is the strategy there for mitigating that risk as we think about uh, moving indoor for indoor sports, or frankly, just people moving in because the weather is cooler, or people traveling for the holidays as we get deeper into fall and the holidays? Yeah, I, I think we've known the strategies for a while. So what we've been doing. I, I'm not the uh, person who's going to decide what what's going to happen in Castle uh, Stadium or Auditorium, but one one would think that mask wearing will be crucial, assuming the airflow and the ventilation um, is adequate. When you're at home, uh, the, again, the CDC has come out with these guidelines and. The wild card there really is, are, are the kids. And as Dr. Bissell said, hopefully soon those vaccinations will happen. We're challenged with masking at school. The CDC has recommended that for everyone. And that's what to do if, if, if people can adhere to that to, to help mitigate the risk. That's part of the solution. Dean Learman, Dr. Bissell, did you want to add anything to that before we move on? I would just say that um, in, in agreement with Dr. Skolnick, but just with a little bit of a twist, you know, um, in, in order for this to be sustainable for people, for human beings in the long term, they need to uh, be able to enjoy freedoms that come in safer circumstances while being vigilant in other circumstances. And I can understand how as much as possible, people would wanna move activities outdoors, getting space heaters, whatever else you need to kind of do as much as you possibly can outdoors with good airflow, 
uh, that's a way to just enjoy um, those that sort of those freedoms of, of being in that kind of a setting that hopefully will offset some of the uh, uh, unfortunate uh, necessities of keeping safe indoors. That's that's how to make it sustainable. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, we are one of many college football towns. Virginia Tech has had, I think, four or five home games now, and the New River Health District numbers have continued to come down. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right that we don't know people who've come from other areas, but we have been offering vaccines. We offered vaccines at the football games and, and the bulk of people who came to the games were vaccinated, not all of them, but, but the vast majority were. And obviously the students, uh, a high vaccination rate. And we have a saying in public health, dilution is the solution to pollution. And certainly outside hot air rises and disperses very quickly. Um, I think we're at the point, you know, we're 20 months into this now. Um, people are tired. Uh, there are people who are over it. There are certain areas of the country where they, the pandemic is gone or there are people who think that the pandemic never existed. And, and we have to acknowledge that from a mental health standpoint, I agree with Dean Learman, let's do the things that we know work. Um, we're not so worried about transmission outdoors. Um, and we encourage outdoor activity as much as possible. We know that indoors in open, more ventilated spaces, it's not as, as big of a deal as in more closed, poorly ventilated spaces. And we know that masks work as a barrier, um, regardless of the type of mask you wear. Um, there, there is a source control component and there is a barrier to a, an infection that's transmitted through the mouth and the nose. And people have to do their own risk assessments. We really have to look at, you know, we have to modify our be behavior according to our risk assessment. Um, and certainly if, if attending an event like that is, is higher risk, you have higher risk individuals at home who can't be vaccinated, who are older, who are immunocompromised, then you may think twice. Um, and certainly masking indoors at sports events right now looks like the, the most appropriate thing because our transmission rates are still high. Um, and who knows where we'll be in the next month, the next six weeks, and you can readdress it at that point. Um, I, I personally, uh, it's very frustrating how masking has become politicized because that's one thing that I, I think people should use that during other outbreaks, if we have a bad flu season, it's probably not a bad idea that you might want to put a mask on when you're indoors or when you're around people. Um, and, and it shouldn't be um, criticized. It shouldn't be frowned upon. People need to do a risk assessment. People need to adjust their behavior accordingly. I'm wondering, the, Dr. Bissell um, and Dr. Skolnick and Learman, are there any potentially um, complicating factors as we get closer to winter? You mentioned flu season, and I know that we have the same recommendations as we approach flu season every year, washing your hands, getting your flu vaccine, but does that complicate things um, now that the pandemic is, is still here and ongoing? Yeah, I, I, I think the answer is it, it may. Last flu season, we saw almost no influenza. And many think that was because of all the masking and other things we did to mitigate, mitigate COVID-19. The Southern hemisphere often predicts what's gonna happen in the Northern hemisphere. And they once again have had a milder influenza season, but people can get either COVID-19 or influenza. Influenza is not as deadly as COVID-19, but it still kills 30 to 40,000 people during a typical influenza year. And there are individuals who have presented co-infected with both SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 and influenza. So the same strategies will work, get your influenza vaccination. And by the way, you can get that at the same time as your COVID-19 vaccination before or after in any order, but that's very important. And continue to use the same strategies that Dr. Bissell mentioned indoors of masking, hand washing, and the like. So I think it is important to consider as, and as a hospital system, before COVID-19, we would always during the winter months have difficulty with open beds and hospital admissions. 
if we ever had influenza layered on top of our current COVID-19, boy, that would not be a good thing. I just wanted to um, ask a follow-up to something you just said, Dr. Skolnick, just to clarify. Um, you said that you could get the flu vaccine at the same time as um, the COVID vaccine or, or booster. Do you mean literally? I ask that because before I know that there was some discussion about if you had to get some other types of vaccines, you may want to wait a couple of weeks in between. Yeah, no, I mean that literally. You can get them one in one arm, one in the other arm at the same visit. Okay. And, th and that's true for most of our other vaccines. As we're talking about the flu, I just wanted to uh, add a, the pers my perspective as an obst obstetrician and gynecologist, because we have talked a lot about pregnancy and and all of this around pregnancy. But we, we do see in a usual year, even with just the regular seasonal flu, that due to a number of, of changes that occur in pregnancy, that pregnant women, even healthy ones, can be at high risk of serious disease, severe disease from just the regular flu. And we see hospitalizations annually on that basis. And flu shots are very safe to give in pregnancy. Well, the same is true, but even more important for COVID because we are seeing um, serious illness occur in otherwise healthy pregnant women as well, other, as well as other pregnancy complications. And so it's very important for pregnant women and recently pregnant women to understand that these, this vaccine is not only safe in pregnancy, but even more important than a flu shot. And of course you can get both of them as we just said, uh, so that uh, unfortunately that you, will, you won't have serious illness from either one of these uh, during this relatively immunocompromised state called pregnancy. So we really uh, wanna push that really hard and make sure pregnant women understand that it's, it's terribly important for them to look at both vaccines this year. And we are seeing flu. We have seen both flu A and flu B. Um, so this is the perfect time to get vaccinated. Um, and you don't have to wait. So you can get them at the same time or you can get one the next day. There, there is no, initially they did have that two week period, but that no longer is an issue. So you can get them um, at any time. And, and it is really important. I think, um, I, I, you know, we talk about the hospitals having the burden of COVID and um, certainly putting flu on top of it. I, I will say that they're also dealing with a lot of people who put off medical care during the pandemic. And so our hospitals remain stretched very thinly. And, and my husband's a surgeon. He was on call last night and they had a patient they were trying to transfer and they called 73 hospitals and could not find a bed for that patient. And this had nothing to do with COVID. This was a patient who had delayed her medical care to the point that she came in much, much sicker. Um, so, you know, I think the, the message is do your best to prevent it and to try and protect our healthcare systems. When we talked about flattening the curve in the beginning of this, that wasn't to make COVID go away. That was to protect our healthcare resources from being overwhelmed. Um, and it, if, if we do have a bad flu season on top of COVID, on top of all these people who have put off care, uh, you know, our hospital systems are, are stretched to the max. And we just have a few minutes left and I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to offer any final thoughts or any takeaway messages that, that you think our audience should hear. Um, Dr. Bissell, would you like to go first? So I think we continue to, to try and encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, vaccines save millions of lives every year. Um, I, I think anyone who still has questions about the COVID vaccine, I would ask that they talk to a trusted medical provider, that they talk to their pharmacist. A lot of people have good relationships with their pharmacist or certainly call the health department. We wanna make sure they have all of the, the true information about um, the COVID vaccine because there is a lot of misinformation circulating out there. For instance, uh, that it affects fertility and it, it doesn't affect fertility. Women have been fine getting pregnant after getting COVID vaccine. Um, there's a lot of misinformation information circulating the, the VAERS system, the adverse um, reporting system. And, and I would say that, you know, correlation is not causation. So you have to be very, very careful. That system is there for a reason for us to follow the safety. Um, this is not new technology. So th there's lots of misinformation and we just want to make sure people have the facts. Um, but from a public health standpoint, vaccines save millions of lives every year. Um, and undoubtedly the COVID vaccine has, has saved hundreds of thousands of lives since it has, you know, we started doing it um, 
And so we will continue to advocate for first dose, second dose, third dose, booster dose, um, and flu shots and all the other childhood immunizations as well. Thank you, Dr. Bissell. Dean Lehrman. I would just echo everything Dr. Bissell said. I'll try to add a few different uh, points as well. Um, this is a roller coaster ride, and this is not going to be uh, ending uh, anytime soon. Uh, the projections for 18 months are the most recent I've heard, but we're going to be doing this for a while. I think people really uh, need to just be ready for things to, uh, to follow the data, for things to improve, for things to surge again, and to be ready to move back and forth between uh, practices that are according, according to the data and the local community data in particular. I will say that, that the way to stop the roller coaster sooner is exactly what Dr. Bissell said, <laughs> is, is to just find someone you trust, ask the questions you need to ask about the vaccine, uh, understand um, that one's true risks of either being vaccinated or not, both for oneself and for one's community. Let's get those vaccination rates up. Let's get to herd immunity. Let's, let's stop this roller coaster ride as soon as we can. Thank you, Dean Learman. Dr. Skolnick? Uh, I would endorse uh, everything Dr. Learman and Dr. Bissell said. Um, I would also say, especially for Virginia Tech, uh, nowhere is an island unto itself. So Virginia Tech exists within a larger regional community, and we exist in a global situation. We've seen with air travel that variants get introduced into the United States and take hold. And in the case of Delta took over, there have been other introductions where that hasn't been the case. So it's, it's, it's hard to think in that way, but it's critical because that's what's going to get us through and out of this pandemic and be able to manage it. It's not just about your classroom or your local group of friends. It's about the larger community and vaccination. Please speak to trusted people, understand that there's a huge amount of misinformation out there. Weigh your, the risks and benefits. Pregnant women is a great example. We have tens of thousands of pregnant women who've been vaccinated now and the risks of getting COVID-19 during pregnancy to the mother and the fetus far, far, far outweigh any tiny risks there may be with the vaccine, notwithstanding the misinformation out there. So be informed, weigh, weigh things uh, reasonably, talk to trusted colleagues who are in the know and make your choices accordingly. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists today, uh, Dr. Bissell, Dr. Dean Learman, and Dr. Skolnick. Thank you for sharing um, all of this information and answering all of our questions. We really appreciate um, this conversation and all you've done for our communities as well. So thank, thank you, you. Dawn. What a pleasure to be with you and my colleagues today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.